So can we? Yeah, right, it's perfect. Um, so thank you very much for the for the invitation to to speak today. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, I tend to wander about when I talk. It drives my students crazy, so uh, I apologize. I hope it's not distracting. Um, so it's actually, uh, I would really appreciate if I could get some feedback from you um, at some point. Um, so we had group meeting in the lab this morning, and I, I told my group, my research group, that I was giving this this outreach talk. And they said, oh, is it for, for students or, or postdocs or something? And I said, no, it's a, it's a lay talk. And they all burst out laughing. Um, and I asked, well, why are you laughing? And they said, no one's going to understand you. Um, so you'll have to tell me at the end of the lecture if I was completely incomprehensible or if, uh, if there was some cool stuff that you learned. OK. Can, you use your outside voice? can I use my outside voice? Yes. So that means I yell? OK, I can yell. Um, I'm also losing my voice a little bit, so we'll see how this goes. All right. <clears throat> Right, so um, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm actually an engineer. Um, so my background is actually in uh, optical engineering. Um, and uh, my undergraduate education was actually in chemistry and physics. My graduate education uh, uh, was actually in, in optical engineering. And uh, <laughs> for, for sort of reasons that are uh, kind of interesting, but I won't go into, I've, I've ended up in, in, in biomedical science doing research. And uh, one of the reasons for this was that I actually became fascinated when I was in uh, senior school in England, which is actually, uh, I guess, high school here, um, with actually uh, spectroscopy and actually using lasers, um, basically, to elicit um, information uh, with, with spectroscopic information. And so one of the questions that I always get asked is, you know, well, why did you get interested in, in lasers? And there, there's a really simple answer for that, uh, which is actually the following. A blank screen. <laughs> That's super awesome. Well, I guess that joke didn't work. So anyway, what you were going to see was like a really cool video that I made of the Death Star firing in Star Wars. But apparently, apparently I suck and I haven't been able to get that to work. So anyway, we'll skip that joke and we'll move on to the science. All right, so here are the things that I kind of want to talk to you about today. And the first is actually um, really the concept of, of imaging using microscopes, okay? Um, and how they're really, by using light microscopes, they're incompatible uh, with imaging on what I like to call biological length scales. And then I want to introduce this concept of correlative microscopy, which is really you know, how we actually image across multiple scales, both spatially, right, so from different sizes, um, and also temporally, across different time scales. And then I want to talk about how we actually use these cutting edge methods um, to study the pathogenesis of disease. And there are two um, particular diseases I want to talk about um, that I'm particularly passionate These are projects that I'm passionate about in the lab. And one is actually uh, pediatric dilated cardiomyopathy, um, which is actually enlarged ventricular uh, space in the heart, which causes congestive heart failure. And then also the pathogenesis of UTI, so urinary tract infection. Okay, so here's kind of a concept of, of microscopy and biological length scales. And, and traditionally, you know, if you think about a microscope, you're thinking about something that has a little lamp, you know, it reflects off a mirror, it goes into, say, a microscope slide with some specimen mounted on it, and you're actually looking, you can change the lens, the magnification, and you can see um, uh, from, say, the whole organism down through sort of the tissue and, and the cellular level. And in fact, when we're using light microscopy, um, either white light, which you see coming just from uh, say a regular light bulb or different uh, you know colors of light across the visible spectrum we're actually using those to investigate um, the structure and function of biological systems and in fact one of the transformative technologies um, in, in light or optical microscopy has been really the the advent of fluorescence okay and fluorescence is a process where you have, say, a molecule, right, so a small chemical, um, and when you put a certain wavelength or color of light into it, it absorbs that light, it absorbs that energy, and then it emits that energy in a different color, okay? And one of the most famous examples of this is really like bioluminescence. One of the most famous examples is actually the jellyfish. And so this is actually a... Um, 
what's the right word? I was going to say brand of jellyfish, but that's not right. Species, right, of jellyfish. Um, it's called Equiora victoria. And in fact, uh, three groups, one uh, run by Roger Chen, uh, one run by Osaka Shiyamura, and one run by Martin Chalfi, independently actually isolated the protein right, from that jellyfish that was actually causing it to emit light. Okay, and they actually ended up calling it green fluorescent protein. And this is actually an X-ray crystal structure. So this is the atomic resolution structure of green fluorescent protein. And it's actually called a beta barrel, um, mostly because the tertiary structure is actually in what we call beta sheets as opposed to the alpha helices. And if we take sort of a, 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 a transverse cut, through that beta barrel. This small molecular structure that you can see here, it's about 30 atoms or so, that's actually the part of the protein that when you put blue light into it, it will actually emit green light. Okay, so it's absorbing blue light and it actually gives you green light back out. And this, was, this protein was originally um, uh, isolated and purified um, sort of in the really late 60s, and actually it wasn't until um, 2008 that, that these three individuals actually won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for their work. And the reason they won the Nobel Prize is that over the intervening decades, both their groups and other groups had actually extended this technology. They'd sequenced um, sort of the nucleotide sequence uh, that, that encoded that protein, they'd mutated it in different ways, and actually they ended up generating what they like to call a whole palette, right, of different proteins that when you put certain energies of light or certain colors into them, they would emit a different color. And why this is important is that you can actually use this to genetically target or label specific cell types or specific tissues. Um, so for example, this is actually um, a plate that has E. coli um, on there, so just bacteria that we've actually um, transfected with the different fluorescent proteins and then we're shining a UV light onto that dish and you can see all of the different swipe patterns we've made uh, with the different bacteria fluoresce different colors. And this has really been one of the transformative technologies in using sort of fluorescence microscopy to study biology. So what do these tools enable us to visualize? When you couple sort of the, ad, the advances in fluorescent protein technology, uh, for example, with different imaging approaches, we can actually image the development of organisms. You're actually looking at the development of, of what's called a zebrafish. Uh, we can actually look at different structures at, say, the tissue level. You're looking actually at the microvilli in the stomach there. Um, this is actually kidney tissue. These are actually skin cells, so skin fibroblasts that have been reprogrammed into what we call an induced pluripotent state. So they're actually, uh, they've been regressed into a state that where we can differentiate them into any different tissue type. And this is actually really at the forefront of what we call regenerative medicine. Um, so, for example, that IPS colony has been differentiated uh, two ways. One, into uh, brain cells, so into neuronal cells. Uh, these are electrically excitable cells in the brain that transmit information. And we know that they're actually neuronal cells because we've stained them um, for a protein which is actually called TUJ1, but it's a protein that is only expressed in neurons. In another case, you see that the red cells there, those are actually called glial cells. In particular, they're a subtype of glial cells called astrocytes. And they're actually um, another predominant cell type in the brain, but they're not electrically excitable. They don't, they're not cells that make synaptic connections with each other and transmit information. They're actually the caretakers of the cell, they're the, of the brain. They actually they, they provide all of the support matrix. And then as we increase kind of resolution, we can now look at single cells. So for example, this is actually a cell where we have labeled um, a, a protein called uricortin 2, which is actually the stress res a human stress response uh, receptor. And we can see that as the cell divides, it actually translocates to the cell membrane 
um, because we can actually see that labeled with a red fluorescent protein. And then as we go up into what we call a uh, sort of super resolution uh, regime, and I'll talk a little bit about that, we can actually see uh, during a single cell division, we can see all of the genomic material. So the chromosomes, they actually condense into chromatids. Um, the, the microtubule network pull them apart. And then as we go to sort of the highest resolution we can with sort of optical or fluorescence microscopy, we can actually look at gene expression patterns. So which, which genes are turned on, which genes are turned off, uh, so on and so forth within, um, within chromosomes. So this is really cool. We can see lots of different things and we can see it from sort of the whole organism level all the way down to sort of the, the gene expression level uh, within a single cell. But we run into a problem and that problem is the I can't see the Golden Gate Bridge problem. So I'm a physicist and, uh, and an engineer as I said and I like analogies and usually the analogies translate into really poor jokes. Mm -hmm. so, so the I can't see the Golden Gate Bridge problem is when you go to San Francisco and you hike up the trail because you want to see the Golden Gate Bridge going over the bay and it's going to look magical and what you end up with is the Golden Gate Bridge shrouded in fog because it's San Francisco and it's always foggy. At least on the three times that I've been to San Francisco. All right, so how, what does this have to do with anything? This has to do with the fact that when you're using visible light, right, uh, light that you can see, there is a limit, right, to its ability to penetrate through what I would call a turbid milieu. So for example, where there's fog, the light doesn't penetrate it and you can't actually see what's beyond it. It makes it opaque. And we have the same issue, right, when you're trying to image in tissue. It's one thing imaging, say, cells in a dish or a very thin uh, slice of tissue. Um, but for example, if it's a really sunny day and you're a pasty white Englishman like myself and you're, you don't bring your sunglasses, you go outside and you're shielding your eyes against the sun and what you'll notice is that in the very thin parts of sort of the skin between your fingers, you can see a red glow. And the reason for that is that the longer wavelengths of light or the lower energy, uh, lower energy aspects of the visible s spectrum can penetrate further through um, uh, through that turbid milieu as opposed to the blues and the greens and the yellows. So when I talked about fluorescence earlier, let's take the case of green fluorescent protein. We put a blue photon in and when I talk about photons, these are really, it's a quantum mechanical phenomenon and really it's like, it's like a part, it's a theoretical particle of light, okay? Uh, light can be waves, light can be particles, it's called wave-particle duality. So let's assume we put in some blue light to green fluorescent protein. This is a solution of green fluorescent protein. I got a blue laser beam coming down through a lens and it's being focused into that little, uh, little cuvette of, of that uh, protein solution. And you can see as the laser is focused in, you can see you're getting that fluorescence report. You can see a focusing cone in and you can see a defocusing cone out. So wherever there's that blue laser, I'm getting that green fluorescence. And the reason this works is that inside that, that, that beta barrel structure of green fluorescent protein, I mentioned to you there was that uh, sort of 20 or 30 atom, atom molecule, and this is what we call the chromophore. This is what absorbs the light, and this is what actually emits the light. And the way that absorption and emission works is basically the molecule in its most relaxed state, um, it can absorb this blue light, and the molecule gets excited, okay? And it gets excited in three different ways right, the ele what we call the electronic configuration, so where the electrons are sitting get moved around, and then it also vibrates a bit and it rotates a bit, okay? So when the chromophore is in this excited state, it basically, we've, we've undergone some electronic reconfiguration, and then what's also happened is that it vibrates and rotates a bit and it loses a bit of its energy. Because it's lost a bit of its energy now, when it actually relaxes back down to its most sort of chilled out state, because we've lost a little bit of energy, it's not the same color that we put in. So now, because we put blue light in, we lose a little bit when we're, you know, excited in the excited state, and then the light that we emit is now a longer wavelength or a slightly lower energy. So that's why we get green light back out. But then the question becomes, does it actually matter, right, how you get from this super relaxed, you know, state to the excited state? And the answer is not really. It's essentially like climbing a ladder. 
you know, if I actually, if there was a space that's this big and I can climb it, or if there's a space that's like half as big, but twice, I can still get from one level to the next level. And so the way that we do that with light um, is instead of actually using uh, visible light, we can actually use infrared light. And basically, we use energy that is half the wavelength that we originally needed. And what we do is that we actually don't use it in what we call the continuous wave sense, so where the laser is on all the time. We make the laser pulse super, super fast. And we make it pulse at a rate that's known as femtosecond lasers. And this means the pulses are actually 10 to the minus 15 seconds long. So they're really, really short pulses. And because of that, the molecule actually thinks that, it, they, th th that those particles of light appear there at the same time. And so what we can do uh, is we can actually make use of the fact that we have longer wavelength or lower energy light to penetrate deeper into um, turbid milieu. So this is actually an example. So the, these are motor neurons. So these are the, the nerve cells that actually transmit information to the muscles. So when I want to move my arm, right, or I want to kick my leg, there's information that's been transmitted from my brain through the brainstem, actually through a very long axon to my muscle. It's transmitted electrical information and that motion occurs. And so these are actually the motor neurons that are in, that are in the spinal cord. So this is actually the case of a, of a mouse. Um, and we've labeled them with green fluorescent protein. And we've actually used the infrared laser as opposed to a blue laser to image all the way through that spinal cord with all of the myelin and the fatty tissue issue that, that normally visible light can't penetrate. Okay, so the next problem we run into is the goal in the football game problem. And when I say football game, I mean a proper football game and not American football. Um, so if I was to pose a question to you all, did that goal get scored? Who would put up their hand and say, yes, that goal got scored? No, not many. Okay, who would put up the hand and say that goal did not get scored? All right, a few more. Wow, you guys are cynical. Okay, <laughs> so why did you pick? Why did you pick each one of those choices? What is it about that image that drove you, right, that gave you a suspicion either way that either that goal got scored or that goal didn't get scored? You don't know, it's statistics, right? You've got a 50-50 chance of being correct. <laughs> exactly true. So this is the real challenge with what I call doing static imaging, right? We have no a priori knowledge of where that football was prior to when this image was taken, and we have no knowledge about where it went after that image was taken. So how, when we just take a single image, or say a three-dimensional image of, say, cells or tissue, how do we know where things were, and how do we know where things go? Because life is a dynamic process, right? It's not a static process. And this is actually where, you know, the development of techniques, and some of which we do in my lab, is to image, you know, life in process. And so this is actually an example of a cell culture. So this is with a cancer biology experiment. And in particular, this is the development of, of what we call oncolytic viral therapies. So these are, these, are, these are viruses that are being engineered specifically to attack cancer cells. And so what you're looking at here are two cancer cells that are in culture. And then you're looking um, at, a, at a viral protein. It's called an adenoviral oncoprotein. So this virus is actually based on, on a serotype of, of adenovirus called AD5. And that sounds super complicated, but if I tell you that virus is the common cold, you will, it will make a lot more sense to you. So this is actually some work that was done actually in trying to engineer the common cold virus to specifically attack cancer cells. And what you see, since we've labeled it again with the green fluorescent protein, that you can see it basically oligomerizing, oligomerizing, producing this protein um, in the cells, and it basically attacks the nucleus where the genomic material of those cancer cells are, and it basically kills them. And we're actually watching this process happening in situ. This is like an eight-hour experiment. Here's another example of actually looking at a single cell actually dividing. And what we're looking at here are two colors. We have green fluorescent protein, which are labeling um, a, a, a nuclear organelle um, that's actually called telomeres. And telomeres are really interesting um, because they're the protective 
They're the protective caps that break PowerPoint. Um, computer guy, could you possibly fix that? <laughs> Thank you so much. Because um, I'm afraid I'm going to break your Adobe magic thing. <laughs> So anyway, I can continue talking. So, okay, so telomeres are actually the protective caps that go on the end of human chromosomes. Um, and the reason that they're there is that basically when cells divide, um, the DNA damage machinery would actually recognize the end of, of human chromosomes um, as a break in the genome. And so there's actually this protein complex that's called the sheltering complex um, that actually covers the end of the human chromosomes. And we've actually labeled that with a green fluorescent protein. Thank you so much. Um, and the uh, genome or the genomic material is actually labeled here in red. Um, and we can actually see that these are not static objects, they're highly dynamic, but the really cool thing about it is, as you watch the cell divide, the telomeres actually translocate to the nuclear periphery. And this was actually work that was done in my lab that was actually fairly seminal in the sense that nobody had actually obser or had observed this phenomenon before. This was the first time that anyone had actually seen this. And I was really offended when we tried to publish it and the, one of the reviewers said they didn't think it was that interesting. And I was like, I think this is super interesting. <laughs> Anyway, okay. All right, so we've talked about light and how we use light to interrogate the static structures. We've talked about you know, how we can use infrared light to, to probe deeper into tissue. Um, and we've, we've talked about how we can use visible light you know, uh, repeatedly to actually image dynamic phenomenon, okay? But this is where I sort of throw a wrench in the works and tell you that there's an inherent caveat to light. And that caveat is a very fierce bearded looking man um, by the name of Ernst Abbe. He's actually one of the, uh, the fathers of, of, of modern optics and, and, and modern microscopy. He actually developed the first microscope in conjunction with Carl Zeiss in Jena, the former Eastern Germany, uh, around 1860-something, because my history is bad. Um, and in fact, in his memorial statue outside the Frederick Schiller University um, at Jena, there is actually inscribed an equation. And that equation, if we ignore the little bit of like angular math that's in there, basically is D equals lambda, Greek letter, it basically means wavelength or energy over two. And what that means is that there is a fundamental limit to how small you can focus light down to. It's called the diffraction limit of light. And it means that there's an intrinsic limit to optical resolution. So let's just take a wave front of light. And let's say this is 400 nanometers, by the way. So let's, let's just assume this is like bluey green light. And we put it through a lens and we focus it down to a spot. And actually, the size of that spot is limited to about 200 nanometers in X and Y. OK, so in lateral space. In contrast, the diameter of a protein in a cell is around 5 nanometers. And you may not know what a nanometer is, so I'm just going to throw this out here. Um, a nanometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. And the analogy I like to use to give you some concept of, of how small that is, is if I was to pluck one of my few remaining hairs, and I was to drop it, drop that single hair, into an Olympic-sized swimming pool, the amount... The, the, the distance that the water would raise, so you know if you jump in a swimming pool, like the water will raise a little bit, so if there's a whole bunch of people that jump in a swimming pool, the water will slosh over the edge, right? This is because there's displacement from that mass. So if I was to pluck one of my few remaining hairs, drop it into an Olympic-sized swimming pool with nobody else in it, the level that the water would raise would be equal to one nanometer, okay? So five times that is the size of a protein. Okay, ten times that, so 10 nanometers is actually the width of a cell membrane. Let's think about a virus, flu virus. We're having a really bad season, apparently. One of my lab was out for 10 days, although I'm pretty sure he went to Mexico because he was like really tanned when he came back. But anyway, so diameter of a virus, 100 nanometers. Diameter of a red blood cell, 7,000 nanometers, or actually 7 microns. Width of a human hair, 50,000 nanometers. Width of James's human hair, probably about 20,000 nanometers, because I'm pretty thin. Okay, so what does that mean for looking inside cells? It means that we have a problem discriminating objects, right? So the smallest object that we can resolve is about 200 nanometers in size, okay? 
So let's say, for example, I want to look at a single protein. And I've had a lot of coffee today, so this may be difficult. But let's just imagine, if I can hold that super steady, that there's a 5 nanometer protein at the, end, at the, beginning, uh, the center of that blob. Does it appear 5 nanometers in size? No, it's going to appear 200 nanometers in size, because that's the minimum size of the object you can resolve. So let's say we have two 5 nanometer objects with this 200 nanometer sort of halo around them, and then we bring them closer together. As they reach 500 nanometers apart, we can still resolve them. But when they reach 200 nanometers apart, we can't actually resolve them. They have coalesced into a single object. So let's do some math, because that's fun, right? <laughs> let's take a single human cell. And again, I'm an engineer, so we're going to assume a cell is actually 10 microns cubed, so 10,000 nanometers in each x, y, and z. So we're going to think it's a cube. So if we assume that we can resolve objects that are 200 nanometers by 200 nanometers by 500 nanometers, we can resolve 20 by 50 by 50 objects. So if we do that math in our head, it comes out at 50,000 objects. So that seems like a lot. Within a 10, mi 10 micron cube, we can resolve 50,000 objects. Let me pose a question to you. How many proteins are there in a single cell? I mean, the answer is a lot, but seriously, like, <laughs> pick a number. 5,000. Oh, wow. OK. A um, little higher. One million. One million. OK, a bit higher. Bingo. Billion objects, and yet we can resolve 50,000 of them. Bit of a wrinkle, right? And so this is where we have the realization that basically light is only partially compatible with biological length scales. And so what it actually means is that we need to use different wavelengths or energies, like charged particles, electrons, negatively charged electrons, positively charged ions, x-rays, to actually traverse the entire structural continuum that I like to call it, from sort of the whole organism level all the way down to the single protein level, okay? And so that's where actually electron microscopy comes in. So instead of shooting light, right, from lasers, we're actually going to shoot electrons, okay? So negatively charged electrons. And one of the things that, you know, when students start in my lab, they say, oh, electron microscopy is boring, Dr. Fitzpatrick. I don't want to do that. It's just gray. Right? The images are grayscale. I want to do this stuff with color. Color's fun. And I said, you know, it's really interesting because when you shoot electrons at a biological sample, you actually generate many different signals. You generate ionization products. So that's when an electron comes in and kicks another electron out, but it has a different energy. So while different colors of light have different energies, the speed at which electrons travel have a characteristic energy spectrum. We can detect that. We can detect backscattered electrons. We can generate x-rays. We generate something called Bremsstellung. I will personally give 50 bucks to anyone that knows what that means. Um, and we also generate visible light via method, method known as, uh, or a methodology known as cathode luminescence. We can uh, measure elastic or inelastically scattered electrons through the sample, and we can also absorb them. So what do these images look like? We can get topographic information. So this is actually a macrophage. So this is an immune cell that's actually eating a bad cell that's died that needs to be cleared out. Okay? So this is a macrophage eating an apoptic cell. These are actually looking... So this is an image that looks at a cross-section um, of myelinated axons. And so myelin, if you don't know, is a fatty substance that surrounds your nerve cells. It surrounds the axons. And this is actually a subject, uh, a research subject that's particularly close to my heart because my mother um, actually died from multiple sclerosis. And uh, multiple sclerosis is actually a disease, it's an autoimmune disease that basically attacks the myelin. It, it degrades it. And basically, if you think about your nerve uh, fibers, your axons, um, as the electrical wiring in your body, you know in your house that your electrical wiring is insulated, right? It's covered with a plastic um, insulator because you don't want the wires to short out. Okay, it's the same deal with like your nerve cells, the axons that transmit the electrical impulses in your body. They're covered with an insulating material, which is actually a, a lipid, a fatty substance, which is called myelin. So what we're actually looking at in this image is you're actually looking at the layers of insulation that surround 
the axon. So this is the part that transmits the electrical information, and this is essentially the densely wrapped myelin, which is the electrical insulation. And then we can actually look at, for example, this is what we call a stem image, but what we're actually looking at here is you're actually looking at the little muscle fibers that actually cause the contractile, um, the contractile motion when your heart pumps. And the thing that's super cool about this image is if I ask you how many images are in this image? You're going to say one, right? I hope you were going to say one. Well, all right, let's just assume you were going to say one. There are actually 72,000 images, right, in this image. And I've downsampled it because otherwise my laptop would really crash. But basically, each one of these images is about that big on the scale of that image. And we have stitched it back together, and it's kind of like a Google Earth. So we have the ability, when we scan the electron beam, to do it over much larger different distances on a sample, and essentially, if I had uh, this on the workstation at the lab, I could keep scrolling my mouse wheel like you would do on Google Earth, and we can actually zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, all the way down to a single nanometer scale, right? So you can actually see individual proteins. All right, so getting back to microscopy and biological length scales, as I mentioned, one of the things that I'm really interested in in, 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 my, in my research is trying to develop technologies that allow you to traverse this entire structural continuum. Really to be able to image, you know, from the whole organism down to sort of the single molecule or single protein level. And one of the fundamental questions is, how do you interface quickly and efficiently between different imaging modes if you're using light, for example, or if you're using electrons or ions, or if you're using x-rays. And this is where a concept comes in, the concept that we've come up with, which is called correlative microscopy. And so this is essentially bridging the gap. And this is usually what happens when light microscopists and electron microscopists come together. Um, they usually stand uh, on either side of a chasm shouting at each other and not listening to each other. So this is usually what happens at scientific conferences. So what is correlative microscopy? And really, it's a very elegant solution to a far more interesting challenge. And, and the challenge is actually finding that needle in a haystack. So finding a really rare structure, but also following that structure dynamically, as we talked about earlier with, with live cell fluorescence microscopy, following that dynamically over time, right? So for example, we can label, so seems like there's a field with lots of corn, right? But what if I told you there were 10 stalks of corn in that field, which are the ones we want to find? And you're going to say to me, no, James, you're crazy. How are we going to find those individual stalks of corn? Well, we can label them, right? And we can make them green. So because we can label them, we can target right, a given fluorescent marker to make them a specific color. We can actually find those specific and rare structures. And now we can identify where they are in that field. But more than that, we can actually follow those changes over time, figure out where they end up, and then look at what structural changes have happened at the nanoscale. And so two applications um, of correlative microscopy that we've been working on over the last couple of years in my lab uh, is actually the study of disease pathogenesis. One, actually in this, in this case of, of dilated cardiomyopathy, and secondly, in the pathogenesis of urinary tract infection. So dilated cardiomyopathy, or, or DCM, is, is actually one of the most common causes of heart failure. And the mortality rate without cardiac transplantation is incredibly high, and the overall impact on quality of life is incredibly dramatic. What's well, more than that, since the introduction of Lasix and Digoxin in, in the 1970s, these are the two most common heart failure therapeutics, there have been no new therapeutics developed for dilated cardiomyopathy. And really what happens in, in, in dilated cardiomyopathy is, you know, the heart, basically the heart is a muscle, it contracts, and it basically pumps oxygenated blood around the body to deliver nutrients to cells, and then it gets returned to the heart, and then it goes through, gets reoxygenated, and pumped out again. So this contractile force 
it's because those fibers, those muscle fibers in the heart, are actually, one, electrically uh, responsive, so with an electric signal that muscle will contract, and secondly, they're, they're elastic. So when they contract, they return to their original form. Okay, it's like an elastic band. Pull it, let go, pull it, let go, it's going to expand, it's going to get back to its original form. In the case of dilated cardiomyopathy, what happens is every time the heart muscle contracts, those muscle fibers, they get a little bit weaker. So imagine that elastic band, you pull it, you expand it, you let it go, it doesn't quite return to the same size, it's getting a little bit weaker each time. So you do this over many times the heart pump pumps 60 you know, times a minute, in my case probably 76 because I should go to the gym more, um, but the more and more the heart pumps, the weaker the heart gets, and then the weaker the heart gets, the more and more it has to pump, and the weaker it gets, and eventually you get to the point of congestive heart failure. All right, so obviously you can't do these kinds of experiments uh, that I do in human, so we actually use what are called model systems. And one model system that we use is actually zebrafish. And it's an excellent model system for research um, because it's basically just a little, little fish, this big, um, eggs are fertilized outside the body, um, they have lots of offspring, uh, the genetic sequence is known, so we can actually modify it easily to add, say, fluorescent markers like green fluorescent protein or red fluorescent protein. And really what's super important for using light is that the fish is optically clear, so you can see through it. So at WashU, um, the developmental biology department uh, at the School of Medicine, um, one of my colleagues, uh, she's a developmental biologist and, and she's a zebrafish um, biologist and, and she's actually built one of the most advanced zebrafish facilities actually I think in the whole US if not the world. Um, it has thousands and thousands of fish, it's all organized by robotics, it's like crazy cool. And the reason that she's interested in this is that actually 84% of the genes that are involved in human disease have a zebrafish counterpart. So we can actually study the pathogenesis of human disease by using the zebrafish model system. And one of my colleagues, uh, Corey Levine, he's a pediatric cardiologist, he practices at St. Louis Children's Hospital, uh, he identified one of these uh, mutants of this, this screen that was done, um, and it's actually a model of dilated cardiomyopathy. And he had an interest in actually doing ultrastructural, so electron microscopy analysis of the heart tissue. So as I mentioned, zebrafish, super cool for doing light microscopy because it's optically clear and we can see through it. Trouble is, when you do electron microscopy, you actually need to stain with heavy metals. And so we stain with osmium, uranium, not the radioactive kind, um, and lead. And the optically clear zebrafish turns into something that looks like this. So that's a bit tricky now because we can't really see into it and we don't know where anything is. So how do we find specific organs or junctions, uh, immunolabeled cells or disease regions, and how do we do it quickly and accurately? And it's kind of like flying into San Francisco because you're always flying in in the fog. So how do airline pilots do this? And they navigate the fog basically by having radar, a control tower, which directs them to the runway. So what we've done is we've actually developed a methodology that actually uses X-ray microscopy to act as our radar to see in this completely opaque zebrafish. We have an algorithm that we've developed called ATLAS that allows us to correlate information from multiple imaging modalities, so from X-rays, from light microscopy, from electron microscopy. And then we make use of a technology called focused iron beam scanning electron microscopy um, to basically create a runway to allow us to look at the three-dimensional ultrastructure of the heart tissue in the zebrafish. So our x-ray microscope is our radar and an x-ray microscope is kind of an interesting uh, technology. It was originally developed for the shale oil field um, and since that sort of you know has kind of uh, not being so productive these days, they're now selling them to academia. Um, and so you're all really familiar, I, I hope, probably with, with, with what we call CAT scans or computed tomography. Um, so if you've broken your leg like I have, um, or you know, you would go in or you've fallen out of a tree, um, you go in and you have a, a CAT scan of your head or whatever so they can see what's going on. 
We can do the same thing in the lab uh, using a methodology known as micro-CT. And basically, we have an X-ray source, we have a sample, and we have a detector. And the magnification that we get is basically dependent on the ratio of the distance source to sample, sample to detector. And in order to get the best resolution, the sample has to be close to the X-ray source. Okay, there's another way we can generate X-rays, which is the synchrotron. So this is a particle accelerator. And what happens is you get collimated X-rays. They're not divergent in a fan. They're collimated. So this way, the spot size doesn't change. So it doesn't matter if the sample's close to the X-ray source or close to the detector. You have the same resolution. And so the way that we actually change that is that we have what we call a scintillating material. X-rays pass through the sample. They hit the scintillator. They generate light. And then a lens, an optical lens, like a microscope lens, actually collects that light, sends it to a detector. And we can change the magnification of that lens, and we can change the resolution uh, that we actually get out. So the X-ray microscope is the best of both worlds. We have a non-collimated X-ray source, but we also have an optical magnification step. So now we can actually get super high resolution without the sample actually having to be close to the X-rays. So it's much safer, and we get resolution at a distance. So this is what the zebrafish looks like after we stain it. This is what it looks like in, a, in a, uh, what we call nano-computed tomography. And you can see there's like the little uh, zebrafish in there rotating. And the way we actually target a region of interest is that once you've done computed tomography, we can actually take that reconstructed data set and we can slice it in XY, we can slice it in XZ, or we can slice it in YZ. And we can actually correlate what we call the block face and also calculate how much we need to remove from the block face to get to the structure of interest. Then we go into the tower, which in our case is Atlas, and this is the algorithm. Um, and it's a single plane workspace where we can take electron microscopy data, X-ray microscopy data, focused ion beam data, and overlay all of those three different imaging modalities in the same coordinate space. And then the FIPSIM, this is actually where we can take our sample. We can actually use this focused ion beam. So this is actually positively charged gallium ions. And we can ablate material off. And then we can actually use the electron beam and we can image what we call the block face. And basically what we end up with is we end up with a high resolution EM image, but then we come in, remove a bit more material, we get a second image, and we do this several thousand times and you end up with a three dimensional digital block of tissue at the nanometer scale. So this is just kind of a movie to show you how the workflow works. So this is the X-ray image of, of, of the computed tomography of the zebrafish. We can actually swap in a higher magnification objective and then get what we call a subtomogram volume. We can then digitally slice through that, identify where the heart muscle is, which is actually right here. This is the heart muscle in the zebrafish. We can overlay that data set back on the low resolution data set. And we can calculate, the purple you see is actually the resin that the zebrafish is embedded in. And we can calculate how much material we need to remove, in this case about a millimeter and a half, to get to the structure we want, which is actually this guy. This is the pericardium, the region of interest that we were interested in. And then we can switch to the focused ion beam and we can actually generate a three-dimensional stack of data that we can then computationally process so this is what the stack looks like. We can then computationally process threshold and segment that out to look at all of the muscle fibers. So this is what we're interested in looking at. And these are actually all of the muscle fibers uh, in the, the distorted muscle fibers that you see in the model of uh, cardiomyopathy uh, in the zebrafish. So basically we have this correlative pipeline Radar allows us to spatially select where we go. The tower allows us to look at multiple data sets. And the runway facilitates our ability to do 3D nanotomography um, at very high resolution. And in fact, this provides a route to unique insights into disease pathophysiology. And so the final thing I want to talk about, and I promise I will be quick, um, is, is the pathogenesis of urinary tract infection. And uh, I became interested in this um, because it's actually an incredibly common and costly disease. More than half of all women and some men are actually going to have a UTI this year. It has a five billion annual cost in the US. And more than that, they're highly recurrent. And it's incredible because 
25% of women with an acute UTI will actually have a recurrent within six months. But some people will actually have greater than six recurrences a year. And you ask yourself, well, how is this possible? Because we have effective antibiotic treatments. And it's not actually antibiotic resistance. It's actually another interesting phenomenon known as uh, basically uh, an intracellular bacterial community. But the reason that trying to understand this methodology is important is because when these uro uropathogenic E. coli infections, and they, uh, UPEC actually causes the majority of UTIs, they're left untreated, you can get cystitis of the bladder and pyelonephritis of the kidney. And these are actually much more um, uh, costly um, and tricky to treat. So most UTIs are actually caused by what we call UPEC. So this is uropathogenic E. coli causes 90% of UTIs, and this is actually an SEM image, a scanning EM image, of the bacteria sitting on uh, the bladder, uh, what we call the uroepithelium, or the urine contacting surface of the bladder. And so the reason that the, the UTIs can become recurrent is this, this concept known as the IBC cycle, or really what we call intracellular bacterial communities. So here's a UPEC, or an XPEC, same as E. coli bacteria. It binds via a lipid raft to the surface of a, of, a bladder, of a bladder cell. And what happens is some cytoskeletal proteins called F-actin actually come up and they basically internalize the bacteria inside the cell. And this is why we call them intracellular. And then what happens once a single bacterium is inside the cell is it proliferates. They divide, they divide, they divide, and they form and mature what we call an IBC. And then what happens is one of two processes. That umbrella cell, so the cell that's on the surface of the bladder, the urine contacting cells, um, and they're binucleated, and that's important. We're going to come back to that. So they have two nuclei in where the genomic material is stored. Those umbrella cells can exfoliate, so they basically fall off, right, because they're really unhealthy. And then they basically burst open, and all these bacteria come out, and then you have a recurrent infection. But simultaneously, what you also have is you have formation of what we call these quiescent reservoirs. So this is where the bacteria basically form this IBC. They go to sleep, basically, and they're sitting in there, and then they're waiting to kind of wake up. So basically, antibiotic treatment gets rid of all of the, the bacteria on the surface. You get better. And then the quiescent reservoir wakes up, and you get a reinfection. So why are we interested in this? It's because this IBC is a protected intracellular niece, and it allows the bacteria to avoid both being shed by the flow of urine and also by being killed by infiltrating immune cells or, in fact, uh, an effective antibiotic treatment. Um, these IBCs allow the bacteria to rapidly increase in number, and essentially what it ends up with is like a foothold situation. It's like you can't ever get rid of it. There's always some leftover hiding somewhere. Okay, And so our rationale is a better understanding of the formation processes of these IBCs and their ultrastructure is actually going to uh, facilitate the identification of new ther th therapeutic strategies um, uh, to treat this process. And this is actually especially important um, as this sort of concept of antibiotic resistance uh, becomes more of a reality. So this is actually just a, a scanning EM of, of bladder tissue, so you can see all of the UPEC, the, the E. coli on the surface. These are actually what we call neutrophils, so these are infiltrating immune cells that are sending out cytoskeletal processes to grab those bacteria, pull them in, and basically um, uh, uh, trap them. Um, so we developed this approach called CLEM, which is correlative light and electron microscopy to study the pathogenesis of the UTI. And the way we did this is we basically used kind of a GPS approach. So you're probably familiar with global positioning satellites. Basically, if you have three satellites that you can bounce a, a, you know, a signal from, you can actually effectively triangulate your position in three-dimensional space on the globe. We can do the same thing on a microscope. If we photo etch or deposit markings on, on, the, on the surface of, of, say, a piece of glass where our sample is, we can actually triangulate the position that we have imaged. Um, and the biggest challenge we faced was actually attaching the bladders firmly or the, the bladder samples to the cover slips. And I had Matt in my group, who's a staff scientist with me. Poor guy's worked with me for a decade, um, and he <laughs> hasn't quit yet. Um, and uh, 
I made him do all of these crazy, like, you know, surface chemistry modifications on the glass cover slips to try and make the bladders stick. And he tried this for six months and he got really irritated with me. Um, and he finally went to Home Depot and bought Gorilla Glue. Um, and I don't know what's in it, but I absolutely recommend never to stick your fingers together with it because whatever it is, uh, the bladders will not leave the glass now. Um, so that's cool. Um, and of course, now I get I told you so all the time in the lab. All right, so we can stick the bladders to the glass. And in fact, this was our first experiment. So you can actually see the, we, the bacteria, um, in this case, are actually labeled with a green fluorescent protein. We've talked about that a lot. So we can put in blue light. They fluoresce green so we can detect them in an optical microscope. We triangulated the position. We then prepared the sample for the electron microscope. The gray image is actually the electron microscope image. And where we have green blobs, we see lots of filamentous bacteria on the surface. Super cool. And then there's a wrinkle. We see uh, green blobs where there are not bacteria on the surface. Oops. And so we thought about this, what could possibly be the problem. And again, with GPS, and you'll know that if you have like an, uh, you know, a really old phone like I do, the GPS is not really good. But if you're like one of my grad students, you have the best possible iPhone. Um, so we clearly pay them too much. And, um, <laughs> And they have like super accurate GPS. So when you're doing triangulation, the accuracy, right, of your, of your, uh, of triangulation process is only as good as like the mechanical accuracy of your stage. And so the accuracy of an optical stage is about five microns or so. And so these cells are a couple of microns in size. So if we're five microns out, it's possible that a green blob is like a whole field away in the electron microscope. So the way we got around this is to develop a multicolor assay. So we have green bacteria and we now have um, the cells outlined in a red fluorescent protein. So now we can actually correlate position using cell shape as well. And yes, we see green where there are bacteria on the surface and we also see green, you know, where there are not bacteria on the surface. And I'm damn, is there still a problem? Um, and it actually turns out we've identified where there are in, in, intracellular, so bacteria that are not on the cell surface, but are inside the cells, we've identified where they are. And so we developed a four color assay. So now we actually have um, the cell shape marker in blue, uh, we have the bacteria in green, we have cell nuclei in purple, so this is where the DNA is in the nucleus, and the reason uh, that we wanted to look at the nuclei in particular uh, was twofold. One, you'll remember I told you these IBCs form actually in the umbrella cells on the surface of the bladder epithelium, and those cells have two nuclei, so it's actually a unique way of us identifying that the IBC is in fact in an umbrella cell. And then we have a yellow marker, which is actually called annexin 5. And annexin 5 is a protein that basically gets expressed when the cells are really sick. So if there's a ton of bacteria in the, cyt in the cytoplasm of that cell, um, it should have a lot of annexin signal because the cell is not happy because there's a lot of bacteria sitting there. And true to form, there's a lot of yellow signal. So then what we did is we did the focused ion beam work. And so you've seen this image before. We can ablate material with our focus beam of gallium ions. Um, and we can also image the block face with our electron beam. So here's that bladder surface. So if I go back to this guy, we're looking at this area right here. And we're going to cut like a little trench. This laser's dying, but we're going to cut a little trench basically at the bottom of that green blob. OK? So this is the bladder surface pre-mill. That's what it looks like post-mill. So after we've got rid of some of the material, and we're going to look basically perpendicularly or orthogonal at that surface. And this is what it looks like. And if we go in at high magnification, true to form, you are looking at the interior of an intracellular bacterial community. You're actually looking at cross sections of E. coli bacteria. And then when I first presented this in, in, uh, at a faculty meeting at WashU, you know, immediately they were like, oh, you know, the ion beam has probably trashed the ultrastructure. You need a way to really verify if you're looking at the right area. And so, OK, well, we can do that. Let's go back and look at the IBC. If we look carefully at the center of the IBC, there's a little purple blob there. That's one of the nuclei. And we can calculate exactly the distance that we need to move in right, to ablate that material to see if that nucleus is indeed there. And so we did that. So we said, OK, we need to polish a bit more material off. We can use a lower energy ion beam. And true to form, there you have it. 
Now you see even more bacteria. You see the nucleus. This is actually the nucleus. And then you actually see um, some of the bacteria that are in cross sections. So either transverse cuts or like cuts through uh, sort of the, the E. coli tube, if you will. And so this is actually the first time that anyone has been able to image the ultrastructure inside an IBC. Um, and in fact, our multi-marker multi approach aided in the refinement of our spatial correlation. Um, and so what we're actually trying to do now is really identify, you know, does the ultrastructure of the IBC relate to or dictate the, pheno uh, dictate the phenotype of the particular infection? And we've done this experiment now um, actually using different bacterial strains, different clinical isolates, um, and the ultrastructure of the IBC is different in each one. So some have bacteria that are packed really closely together. Some, like this example I'm showing you, actually have um, bacteria that are spaced further apart. So is there, is there some relationship? I don't know, but that's the next step in the study. So what I want to finish up with and just say is that what used to be a really disparate set of imaging techniques, I think has really you know, transformed, even over my uh, sort of 15 year career, has transformed into this cohesive array of primary tools to investigate the structure and dynamic function um, of biological systems. And, and the power in the toolbox, particularly for the study of disease pathogenesis, is really in this correlated use of multiple um, techniques. What does the future hold? Um, one of the things I'm super excited about is actually imaging down at the protein level um, and we've just implemented uh, what we call cryo-electron microscopy, so really frozen uh, uh, cryogenic temperature electron microscopy and, and some of you may be aware that they actually, uh, cryo-EM won the Nobel Prize um, in 2017 for medicine for, for cryo-EM. And so I just want to show you one example and then I will shut up and let everyone go. Um, so this is actually a concept known as cryo-electron tomography. We actually flash, flash freeze samples um, by plunging them into liquid ethane. Um, we can put them on we call, what we call a, a grid. We can load them in an electron microscope and then we actually shoot an electron beam. Electrons are green by the way. And uh, we tilt the sample and as we tilt the sample we take individual images. And then as we actually have what we call a tilt series, and we usually do plus 60 to minus 60 degrees in about uh, single degree increments, it's about 120 images, we can actually back project each individual two-dimensional image into a three-dimensional volume. And so this is actually data that came off the microscope today. I'm super excited about it. And this is actually um, a project um, looking, um, looking at ciliary disease. So basically the, the cilia are the, uh, the sort of the, the little flappy objects that can remove fluid from the lungs. And what we're actually looking at here is an atomic structure of an individual cilium. So you can actually see all the microtubules, you can see all of the individual protein complexes that are within the individual uh, cilium. You're actually looking at true atomic structure um, in a completely physiologically relevant sample, which I think is like incredibly cool. And on that note, I will acknowledge uh, people that, that work in my group and also a lot of my collaborators. And over the last sort of decade or so, I've been very grateful to be funded by a variety of sources. And I, and I, hope, you, I hope I've been able to give you an insight into some of the things that we do. And, and even if I've been completely uh, incomprehensible, I hope that my excitement about what I do uh, has at least been conveyed to you guys. And, and really thank you for, for taking the time uh, to come. And, and I, I really do hope you enjoyed it. So thank you. Thank you.